It is a real privilege for me today to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Amy Orr Ewing. Um, Amy is an international author, speaker, and theologian, and she addresses the deep questions of our day and looks to find answers within the Christian faith. She's authored multiple books. You can buy some of her books at the back of the chapel after the meeting today. She holds a doctorate in theology from Oxford University. She speaks regularly to business leaders and students. She's spoken at the White House and the Houses of Parliament. And I know that she feels she's reaching the pinnacle today as she comes to speak to you at Welcome Church. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much. I mean, what could be more thrilling than being next to the Pizza Express in Woking? <laughs> you guys must be really sick of that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the welcome. What an amazing time of worship we just enjoyed. Thank you to the team for that. Wonderful to experience God's presence together. Um, I do have a couple of books here with me. Um, one is called Where is God in All the Suffering? We're going to be thinking about that question today. But in this book, I kind of look at things like anger, grief, sickness, mental illness, violence, natural disasters, systemic suffering. How could a loving God exist and that be our reality? Um, and then I've also got a book called Why Trust the Bible, which you may be interested in. So um, today, we've got some time together to think about this question, the question of suffering, and in particular, how we as Christians engage with it, what, what we feel about it, as well as equipping us, hopefully, to speak into our world with confidence, into a suffering world, and um, introduce people to who Jesus is. But I want to begin by giving you a little bit of personal testimony and background so um, my father was born in Germany in 1942. My grandfather was um, a brilliant scientist, a very committed atheist. And um, where they lived in Germany after the war ended up being occupied by the Russians, so the Soviet um, occupation. So my grandparents experienced really horrific suffering living under two different totalitarian regimes, first Nazism, then um, communism. And uh, my dad remembers um, being so hungry that they went to forage to try and find mushrooms to eat. He still can't eat a mushroom. My, my grandmother... Um, experienced everything that you would um, associate with, with living as a woman in a place that is occupied in that kind of way, just horrific suffering. In um, 1948, my grandfather had, because he was such a brilliant scientist, he made contact with um, the British and made arrangements for the family to be able to leave, to escape. And what happened is that a small plane was going to come and land on a piece of grass quite near where they lived. And they would get up that day um, and leave everything they owned, everyone they knew, and walk to that place and get onto that plane. And that is what happened. My dad was six years old. And they landed at RAF North Holt in um, 1948, in just the clothes they were standing up in. My grandfather went on to have a career in science here in Britain. My dad um, grew up here, but the context for them was that my grandfather was such a committed atheist that he forbade the mention of the word God and a Bible was not allowed to cross the threshold of the house. My dad went on to become an academic as well and um, in, the, in the 60s he went to Canada and then he taught in universities in America, met my mother in Canada. My mum had had a quite sort of traditional British upbringing, um, you know, Church of England C&D, Christmas and Easter if you're lucky. And she described um, going to school chapel as like receiving a vaccination. Um, you know, you have a little bit of the poison and it puts you, it, 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 it makes you immune for life. So she was completely against any kind of religion as well. So they met and married and um, my dad was at the LSE and then he got his dream job in Sydney, Australia. 
and he was teaching at the University of New South Wales and they had lovely climate, really, really nice house. My dad loved his job, brilliant um, people that he worked with, two fantastic children, a wonderful beach kind of very close by. And my father began to say that he had one question, he was really, really happy on every level, but there was one question that occurred to him that made him worry. And the question was this, when I get to 65 and I retire and I look back on my life, will this be enough? And that question unsettled him. A colleague um, at the university invited him one day to come at lunchtime and to hear a Christian who'd come onto campus to, to speak. And funnily enough, this is something that I now do quite a lot. For 25 years, I've been working in ministry, speaking in 40 countries, often in university campuses and other settings where people don't have any faith. But this guy came onto campus and he gave a talk about the Christian faith. And my, my father described sitting there in astonishment, thinking this guy is making what he called a category mistake. That means you put two things together that don't belong together. Because the guy put together the idea of truth, reality, evidence with God, Jesus and faith. He thought they don't belong together. God, Jesus and faith, that's about superstition, wish fulfillment, certainly not about evidence or reality. That's about kind of family traditional, maybe um, a bit of personal preference for the weak-minded. But it doesn't go together with truth. But one sentence that the guy said really stayed with him. The sentence was this, the reason you should be a Christian is because it's true. And that kind of disturbed my father a bit. A few weeks later, he was at home and he was just marking some papers in his study. My mum was asleep, my sister and I were asleep. And he had a vision that extended over two hours. And in this vision, he saw his life flash before him, be replayed. And as different situations from his life were replayed, he saw the reaction on the face of Jesus to how he had lived. And I would say to him afterwards, how, Dad, how do you know it was Jesus? He said, I don't know, I just knew it was Jesus. But at the end of this vision, and as he experienced this, he realised that he needed forgiveness. It would be what Christians would describe as conviction of sin, but he certainly didn't have those words for it. So at the end of the vision, he sees Christ on the cross and he understands he's being offered forgiveness and he, he finds himself kneeling down. But because he's never been raised with any words whatsoever to pray, he's, the first thing he ever says to Jesus is, give me the words, I don't know how to pray. And these are the words that came. He looked at Jesus on the cross and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And he got up off the floor a Christian. He was quite surprised a few weeks later because he'd gone to a shop to buy a Bible because his friend who was a Christian had moved away. And he thought, I think Christians read the Bible. He was quite surprised to read in Mark's gospel, someone else say that to Jesus. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So he goes up to wake my mum up and says, Jane, the most fantastic thing has happened. I've become a Christian. <laughs> and my mum was less than pleased. <laughs> so um, my mum was sort of like hoping it would be a passing phase, but it didn't pass because my father started to think, how could we meet other people who know Jesus? Maybe church. <laughs> Maybe that is what that is. So he said to my mum, I'm too embarrassed to go on my own. Will you come with me? And she says, I know my husband is intelligent. I know how to cure him of Christianity. So she said, OK, I'll, I'll come to church with you on one condition. It's got to be Anglican. She's thinking, once he's experienced that, he'll be cured for life. <laughs> he'll be absolutely fine. So... It's Sydney Diocese. They show up at this Anglican church. It's a Bible-believing church. After a six-month intellectual and spiritual struggle, my mother had a very profound spiritual fear of death. And um, once she kind of, on her journey, encountered the risen Christ, she was completely delivered and set free. 
So my parents then became very over-the-top Christians and loved the Lord, you know, in multiple three dimensions and more. And um, I grew up in a context where I saw the reality of a living God who had broken in to our reality, not a projection of our minds or any kind of historic family tradition or personal preference. This was a living God who actually encountered people in this real world. And as a, as a young person and then a teenager, um, I decided to follow him. And for 25 years, I have been serving Jesus as a theologian and speaker, speaking around different places, but often in contexts where people don't have faith, And they have a lot of questions about Christian faith and actively don't believe. And one of the questions that I found a lot of people have, including inside the church, is this question about suffering. And so that's what we're going to think about together today. Where is God in suffering? Now let's think about suffering together. We could think about the thousands who have died in Gaza We could think about um, the people sort of horrifically killed in Israel. We could think about the war in Ukraine, thousands again devastated by that. My husband and I had two women who who came straight after that conflict emerged, a, a grandmother in her 80s and her daughter in her 60s, and they stayed with us for, for that year. I'm sure some of you welcomed Ukrainian refugees as well. Perhaps closer to home in a room like this, there will be some of us who've struggled with traumatic experiences, depression, anxiety, illness, grief over the loss of someone we've loved. We're all going to have and bring different personal experiences of suffering to this question. But I'm sure all of us in the course of our lives, if we haven't yet, will find ourselves asking the question, why? Why is this happening and why is it happening to me? And if we've got faith or we've got faith on the horizon of our lives, where the heck is God when this is happening to me? Why is God letting this happen to me? How could God be loving and this be happening? So this isn't just a question that our friends who are are perhaps secular or who have objections to faith face. This is a question that we as Christians face and we're all going to bring personal experience to it. A close friend of mine a little while ago died unexpectedly, leaving three children. And she'd just given birth to her six-week-old baby. I held her baby at her funeral and walked behind her coffin and it was utterly devastating. Perhaps you, like me, are close to people who've endured the horrific experience of sexual abuse, shattering and horrendous, let alone walking through the process of a trial and enduring the justice system. As we reflect together on the question of suffering and we consider why it happens, why it hurts so much, and where God might be in it all, I want to begin by acknowledging the seriousness of the question and the reality of the different experiences we're going to bring to it in a room like this. But I also want to begin by saying that it isn't only Christians who need to answer this question of why suffering. And actually, we are going to consider what the Christian faith has to say about the question of suffering. But we're going to begin by thinking about some of the alternatives. Because sometimes when you look at the alternatives, it helps you understand your own view, your own worldview. And it isn't only the Christian faith that needs to answer this question. So the first possibility when it comes to suffering in this world that I want us to think about is the idea of karma. I don't know how many of you have friends who sort of say, oh, it's karma. You know, any TV show now that you watch or just conversation you might have out there, it's a word that's thrown around a lot. 
But here's what karma is. You see, Eastern philosophy views human suffering through dual lenses of karma and the idea of reincarnation. So what that means is when something painful happens, karma tells me that there is a moral law of cause and effect which guides the circumstances of our lives. So this is what karma essentially means. If I get a disease or you have an accident or some disaster befalls you, karma tells you it is your fault. What you are experiencing is as a result of the moral law of cause and effect, you have done something to deserve it. Now, the thing that makes this even more complicated is this idea that I deserve the pain, I've done something to deserve the suffering. That reason may not be immediately obvious to me because it may be that it's a result of something that happened in a previous incarnation. Because the universe recycles itself over and over and over again. And so this may be karma working itself out in your life, but the cause is very, very far away from you. Now, just in case you think, no, that sounds absolutely mad, this is a belief that a lot of people hold. Seriously, I used to have a neighbour in Oxford. It was a couple. He taught at the university, and she was deeply and profoundly into Eastern thought. And we used to discuss things over the garden fence, you know, in one of those terrace houses where your garden is a very thin strip. And um, we would chatter away over the fence. And she believed that she had been a member of the French resistance during the Second World War and that her failure to pass on a particular message during the war was the cause of her back pain in this life. She was in her 30s, by the way. So she, you know, this was a previous incarnation of herself. So her back pain in this life was karma running its course as a result of her failure. But essentially what struck me in that was if I suffer, it's because I deserve it. Karma is cruel. Now, alongside that, you may, may have also in Eastern religion, the ideas of Buddhism, which is a kind of way of processing suffering. You see, Buddhism at its heart essentially encourages its followers to seek detachment from material things and from people as a way of processing suffering. And the Buddha himself left his wife and newborn son, first child, on the night that his child was born. The Buddha lived in a palace and he left it all the day his baby was born to seek enlightenment. Because he knew and went on to teach that enlightenment means moving away from all emotional bonds. The way to deal with suffering is to become a person utterly detached. So that is one option. Eastern thought, the law of karma, the law of moral law of cause and effect with reincarnation, and then the option of seeking detachment. Second possibility that's very popular in our culture is the idea of fate. Everything is predetermined. And the most numerically popular version of this is the religion Islam, which is a monotheistic, there is one God perspective, but it tells us that there is a transcendent God who is absolutely and directly in control of every aspect of the universe. There is only one will in the universe, not yours, not yours, not mine, there is only Allah's will. That is why the word inshallah, God willing, is so important. It's the mo one of the most important phrases you will hear. The idea that there is just this one will. A few years ago, a friend of mine described to me his experience of working with a group of young people in the Middle East in leadership development. And he was re required to take them through a survival exercise that may sound a bit like what some of us did to get a swimming badge in, in Britain. So they'd taken over a disused hotel and they filled the old swimming pool with water and basically the people had to put on their packs and their boots and everything. And then they, they were, this was all explained, you're going to be pushed into the deep end and the goal of the exercise 
is that you get to the surface of the water and you tread water for whatever it was, a minute, two minutes. Anyone in this room done this? <laughs> yes, thank you. We need prayer ministry afterwards. <laughs> so um, this happened. The first two recruits were pushed into the deep end of the pool and the, one of them sunk like a stone. The other struggled to the surface, you know, got himself out and everything was fine. But my friend and the other instructor realised Houston, we have a problem. Someone needs to dive in. So my friend dives in, gets hold of the guy at the bottom of the swimming pool. They get his pack off. They drag him to the surface. They pull him out of the water. They give him a big sort of hit on the back. The water's coming out and he's breathing. He's living. He's going to be okay. And they shout at him, why didn't you swim? And he looks at them and he shrugs. And it says, if it be, he said, if it be God's will, I live, I would live. If it be God's will I die, I would die. Clearly, since you rescued me, it was God's will I live, inshallah. <laughs> this is not a joke. I mean, it's fine to laugh, don't worry, I'm not telling you off. <laughs> it's a mindset that may feel alien to some people in this room, but is an incredibly popular view of the world. Total determinism in, and as human beings, we're utterly powerless. So if we ask the question, where is God in all the suffering? Well, God's will is the only will in the universe. So if there is suffering and evil, it happens because God willed it. Muhammad was even asked this in the Hadith and you know, goes into further detail about it. The pain you may be carrying in your life is because God willed it. You just have to accept it. No questions. So that's option number two. Option number three, that is very, very popular, probably the most popular option in our cultural moment, is the idea of naturalism. Naturalism is a belief system derived from the idea that the only things that exist are material. They are physical. There is no God behind the universe. There is no spiritual or religious dimension to life. Human beings are the highest form of our own authority. We determine our own destiny and we determine our own morality. Pain, within this way of seeing the world, is essentially random and meaningless. It's just a consequence of living in a physical world and nothing more. And since physical and biochemical realities are all that exist, that is the only level at which we can experience or speak about suffering. So if you suffer or if I suffer, Suffering, like everything else, is purely material. All that is happening is that the atoms of the blob of your body are reacting in a particular way to physical stimuli. And there is nothing more to it than that. Part of my work, I work a bit in advocacy. And I can tell you that every survivor of sexual assault that I have ever known knows that the pain and suffering they experience is far more than the bruise endured or the flesh torn. Moreover, naturalism tells us we hear by this process called survival of the fittest, where the strong have eliminated the weak and overcome. So our survival instinct is what drives us and defines us as human beings. So what I find myself asking advocates of naturalism, including those who are incredibly enraged about the injustices in this world, go to any of the demonstrations on university campuses around the world and you will find people who are outraged at injustice, who see evil and suffering in this world and they feel deeply about it and they put their tents up and get their placards and march against it. But here's the question. If all you are is the stuff of your body, if all you are is the biochemistry of you, and so is that other person who's suffering on the other side of the world, 
and you have no evolutionary predisposition to care about their survival, why are you so angry? Why does any of it matter? And what I've begun to see is that the rage in our cultural moment amongst young people, calling for justice on all kinds of issues, issues that really matter, cannot be warranted by a worldview that tells them they're just the start of the atoms of their body. That worldview is not big enough to hold the rage. The suffering we experience is more than physical. Why? Does human life have essential value? Might it be that our rage against injustice and suffering in this world is actually pointing towards God and not away from him? So amid the potential starting places for considering suffering, whether it's um, Eastern thought, karma and reincarnation, Buddhism, whether it's Islam, fatalism, or whether it's naturalism, the idea that there's no God, amidst all of that, there's another alternative. And I want to spend the rest of our time together exploring it. It's the Christian perspective. And this point of view sets forth the idea that God really does exist. That God is a personal being and that God is essentially loving. The definitional statement of the New Testament that begins, God is, finishes with the word love in the book of 1 John. God is love. God does exist. He's a personal being. He's essentially loving. And that God has made human beings in his image. We are not the product of a process of chance and we are more than the sum of the atoms of our body. Every human being, whether we believe God exists or not, is made in the image of God. Our lives have a transcendent source. We are image bearers of the divine and that would mean that our lives are essentially sacred And that would mean that pain and suffering matter and they hurt us at more than a physical level. That would mean that our suffering has a kind of transcendent meaning as well and I think it explains why pain hurts as much as it does. The faceless law of karma that tells you you deserve it can't explain why suffering hurts so much. Naturalism's explanation that you're just a blob of atoms can't tell you why suffering hurts so much. So Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells us that human beings are created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. And the Bible's answer to the question of why God allows suffering or how there could be a loving God and how there could still be suffering in this world built on this essential claim that human beings have been created in the image of God. Now that actually has huge meaning in different ways. And if we were doing an exegesis of Genesis 1, we might go into that in more detail. But we're just going to focus on and in on this idea of God as love. So God is love. God has created human beings in his image. That means he has created us, unlike other creatures to have this capacity to love. For love to exist, though, I want to suggest to you today, ladies and gentlemen, freedom must exist. As a teenager, I grew up in Birmingham, where my parents were leading a church in the inner city, and I became friends with a girl whose parents were trying to force her into a marriage with someone she had never met. She was 15, I was 15. She was afraid and she had very good reason to be afraid. A few months earlier, her cousin had been in the same position and her cousin had decided to run. She'd gone to a different part of the city and hidden out and stayed with friends. 
And the relatives had worked out where she was and lain in wait for her in a car. And when she was crossing the road one day, they drove the car into her, knocked her down, and put her into the back seat of the car, and no one saw her again. My friend um, drew the conclusion that her cousin had been taken out of the country to, to, to marry, and she never heard from her cousin again. Now, I remember my teenage friend expressing the thought that she wanted to live a life in which she could give and receive love. And she felt intuitively at a very deep level that that needed to involve her having some kind of agency. Now, our whole legal system is based on this, right? You cannot force yourself on another individual. We know this to be true. For love to be possible, it has to be freely given and freely received. Now, friends helped her to get to a safe house. She later reconciled with her parents. But right at the beginning of the Bible, God, who is love, makes a world in which love is possible. And that entails a world where human beings have the actual and real capacity of choice. So the idea put forward is that human beings have used our capacity to choose. We've used that to harm as well as to love. And the impact of our exercise of choice has impacted our relationships with each other. It's impacted our connection with God. And it's impacted our connection and relationship with the natural world. That's what Genesis says way before the research on climate change that there's a direct impact of human selfishness on the fabric of the universe. We've used our capacity to love. We've used it to love, but we've also used it to harm. So the Christian faith understands suffering as having come into this world as a direct result of our human exercise of moral choice. And so suffering hurts And it really hurts because we're more than our biochemistry and we're not here by accident. And whether we believe in God or not, our lives have a transcendent source and meaning. And that means that our suffering has this profound dimension. So this might help explain why pain is so acute for us as human beings. It might help us understand how it could be possible that God is loving and exists and this is the world there is. But the Bible doesn't just leave us at diagnosis. The Bible doesn't just leave us at an explanation as to why things might be as they are. Now, one obvious question that I'm often asked and I'm sure you are too, is, okay, 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 okay. Right. Okay, God, God has done this, and he's done whatever. But why doesn't God intervene then? Why doesn't God just intervene and stop the instances of suffering? And by the way, I think this question is worse for Christians because we believe God actually loves us. And we think, if my child, who I loved was in a situation of danger or assault or experiencing a disease and I had the capacity and facility to do something about it, my love would compel me to do it. But why doesn't God? And so it can feel deeply painful to us as Christians when we feel God is somehow inactive in our suffering. But here's how C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, talks about this. He he basically says, look, if God constantly intervened to, um, to, to, to stop every instance of suffering, if, for example, someone was about to hit you with a piece of wood and God intervened and turned it into a blade of grass and it brushed across your face, or if someone was verbally assaulting you and the tirade of expletives is coming raining down on you and God were to do something miraculous, intervene and change the air so that the words are changed. What would happen very quickly is that our freedom would be lost with all the interventions required. And we would lose who we are as human beings and the capacity to love. We'd become robots. 
Where is God in the suffering of this world? Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you this morning that the message of the Bible is not just an explanation. It doesn't just give us an origin story which helps us make sense of this world. The message of the Bible is that God is so loving that he doesn't abandon us to our suffering. He offers us his very presence and life in the midst of this dark world, in the midst of our suffering. And Jesus is God made flesh entering our world in human history, revealing what God is like, sacrificing himself for us and suffering with us and for us, for love of us. At the heart of the Christian faith, there is a demonstration of the love of God. Now, the New Testament has this famous phrase, God has demonstrated his love for us in this. Now, some of you will know the next few words of the sentence. I want you to imagine that you don't know the next few words of the sentence. I have three sons. They're all teenagers. My twins are 18. My youngest is 15. And um, my youngest is in, in the, he's having a massive growth spurt. He's hugely into cricket. You know, he's, he's super cool. And as, as his mother, I just have to grasp the crumbs that fall from the table of his affection. You know, you just lay hold of what you can get. And if you're given a smile, you know, it just utterly thrills me. If you're given a hug, it's like, please don't be over the top about it, mummy, you know. And I think, you know, uh, I, I, I love my children so much. And a demonstration of love is just so powerful and wonderful, isn't it? In the relationships that we value, to feel loved. God has demonstrated his love for us in this. What would you insert? What would be meaningful to you? He's provided what I need. He gave me the healing I longed for. He intervened and stopped the infertility I've been struggling with. He brought the life partner into my life that I've prayed for. He did some sky writing and revealed some extraordinary truth. He poured his Holy Spirit on me so I was drenched in his love and filled with his spirit. Well, guess what the New Testament says? God has demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The suffering of the Son of God by crucifixion is the demonstration of a loving God to a suffering world. In other words, not a God who is powerful and distant and transcendent, who observes your suffering and feels pity for you from a distance. But a God who comes running towards you and me and this suffering world and is willing to go to the cross for us as a demonstration of his love, but also to carry away the consequences of our misuse of our capacity to choose. The cross shows us the God of love in the flesh. A God who suffers with us and for us. A God who is not remote and distant. This is how one of my favourite theologians, a man called John Stott, this is what he, how he puts it. He said, I could, myself never believe in, I could myself never believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. Friedrich Nietzsche was a German atheist philosopher who had this idea of the ubermensch, the strong man, which is actually now we're beginning to see take hold again in the West, but who, who Hitler loved and who ridiculed the idea of God's weakness. The only God I could believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could we worship a God who was immune to it? He goes on, I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of the Buddha, legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of this world. But each time, he says, I've, after a while, I've had to turn away and in imagination instead, I have turned to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. 
nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry, intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. At the heart of the Christian faith is a loving God who promises his presence with us when we suffer. And this is not theoretical. He is prepared to die by crucifixion to demonstrate his love. And at the cross, God comes close to us in Christ. All our rubbish, all our exercise of choice that has perpetrated harm on another image bearer. All our exercise of choice that has perpetrated harm on this world, this universe that God loves. All the things, the wrongdoing that has been done to us that has harmed our body, traumatised us, oppressed us, abused us. Jesus offers us new life through his suffering. Jesus offers us light in the darkness, help from outside, the presence of a loving God and the promise that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not, will not, cannot, shall not overcome it. So we live as people of the light, prophetically holding fast we, the promise of the Bible is not, if you love Jesus enough, you wouldn't suffer. The promise of the Bible is not, if you have really, 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 really prayed, then you would get the miracle. Miracles that happen, they're God's intervention, heaven breaking through onto earth, signs of that future reality. Wonderful, wonderful interventions that happen. They are not well done badges to the especially good Christians. So if you are here today suffering and wondering, does God really love me? The heart of the Christian faith says, yes, he does. And he has demonstrated that in history in Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that the image that Jesus, a first century 30-year-old celibate male, let that one sink in for a moment, The image that Jesus chooses to use to describe what it means, what it feels like, what it is to come to know God, is the image of birth. My first birth experience, I gave birth to twins. Sorry, I can't help it. I'm an overachiever. (laughs) Any other twin parents in the house? Right, we have to high-five each other. We've survived. We've lived to tell the tale. So I went into hospital, um, into a London hospital, and obviously my husband came in with me, and let's just say, for anyone who hasn't yet been in the birthing room, it was visceral and there was blood on the floor. I apologise for that, but it's a talk on suffering. It was extremely, extremely painful, and it's like a wrestling match to get life to come forward. But we left that hospital, having gone in as a couple, we left as a family of four people. It is undeniable. My twins are now 18. They tower over me. It is undeniable that they live, that they exist, that they are real. That is the image Jesus Christ uses to describe what it means to come to know God. It is as real and visceral as being born. So you can be born again because Jesus has suffered for you. You and I can experience that new life, that cleansing from within so that the harms of this suffering world that we have experienced, the harms that we have perpetrated that have caused the suffering of others and the breakdown of cultures and the climate, all of that harm can be forgiven and dealt with by Jesus. And he gives new life. 
He brings light in darkness. And I've seen him do it in my own life. And I've seen him do it with people that I've seen come to know him, whether teenagers rescued from gang violence on the streets of London, or whether meeting the leaders of the Taliban in Afghanistan and giving them Bibles, meeting the religion minister for that regime, giving him a Bible and hearing him say, thank you for bringing me this book. I'm going to read it every day. I've been praying to Allah for years. I could have a Bible. Light in the darkness. I've seen him do it with gangsters and gangster capitalists in the city of London or the big commercial centres of this world. The wealthiest people you could imagine with the deepest sense of misery within. Coming to know the living God, the God who is love, who meets us in our suffering in this dark world. The Bible is not just an explanation of why suffering happens, but in Christ we encounter the God of love and experience his help and rescue in the midst of this dark world we all know and recognise. For those of you who are followers of Jesus today, I want to encourage you. The question of suffering is not just a question that Christians have to answer. We've considered some of the alternatives and I hope you can see that what the Christian faith has to offer is unique intellectually, existentially, in reality. Unique, powerful, wonderful. But this is more than theory. Our God is a living God, a loving God, who pours his love and Holy Spirit into our hearts, including when and as we suffer. Let's be those who share that love in this dark world and bring that light. Amen. Wasn't that just a treat? I don't know about you, I just felt I could have um, listened to Amy for hours. Thank you so much, Amy, for that. Just what, what a helpful sort of um, layout of all the different worldviews around suffering. And what a, what a hope that Amy helped us just to, to look at and focus on, on the fact that, that, that God himself draws near to us in our suffering. And more than that, Jesus himself, the Son of God, gave his life and suffered immensely for you and me. What an amazing message. Amy, thank you so much. Um, if you felt like you could have just heard her more like me, why don't you buy a couple of Amy's books and you therefore can. Um, Where is God in all the suffering? That's one of the books Amy has for you to be able to buy at the back. And the other one, Why Trust the Bible. But I'd love to pray for us just before we wrap up this morning. Why don't you, if you're happy, just close your eyes. and I'm just going to pray for us. Father God, thank you for the wonderful truths we've been hearing and and reflecting on this morning. Thank you, Father God, that all the different worldviews on suffering, the beautiful one, is the one of Christianity, the God that draws near in our suffering. Jesus, thank you that you drew near, you came to earth and you gave your life for every one of us. You suffered that we might know new life in the family of God, that we might know forgiveness, we might know hope. Thank you so much, Jesus, for that. And thank you, mighty God, that whatever anyone in this room or watching online is going through, thank you, Father God, that your desire is that they would allow you to draw near to them in their suffering, to bring strength and peace and pour your love into their hearts and to give them hope. And I pray for every one of us. Help us to take a step closer to you this morning as we reflect on how good you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.